this early. Uh, my name is Mark. Uh, I work for Google. Um, this is a short talk about um, trying to find ways to um, isolate data and execution inside uh, PKVM. So, um, quick forward. Uh, so, PKVM, for those who don't know about it, aims at uh, providing isolation, very strong isolation between host and guest, uh, in the sense that the host cannot spy on what the guest state is. Um, and there's a talk tomorrow by Quentin Perret, uh, which will give you a deep dive uh, into what PKVM is and how it actually works. Uh, it's unfortunate that the talks are in that order, because a lot of things would make more sense the other way around. Um, but please have a look. Um, so this, this is very heavy on the um, ARM64 architecture side, uh, because that's what PKVM uh, runs on at the moment, although there are rumors. Um, but if anything uh, seems obscure, I'm sure it will be, uh, please shout. And of course, all of that is a, is a work in progress. Uh, nothing really works. Uh, well, it does, but still, there's still a lot of work to do. So uh, first, let's start with a few silly consideration. And the uh, first thing is that software is buggy, newsflash. Um, we have read gadgets um, in hypervisors. They're not that hard to find. Just have to, to look a bit. Um, and it's really unfortunate in the case of confidential computing because uh, the hypervisor has, has access to state that would be better kept private. This is certainly the case with PKVM, uh, both in terms of with gadgets and uh, having access to that state. Um, and the, the, the more code you're going to add to the privileged part of the hypervisor, um, like the, the more you'll be susceptible to these sorts of attacks and the more fragile the whole thing becomes. So what can you actually leak? Uh, well, the hypervisor maps a, a bunch of uh, guest-specific data structures. And probably the most interesting one is the, is the vCPU structure. Uh, KVM structure is also interesting, but the vCPU one is, is really the juicy one, has all the registers and stuff. Um, and also the fact that um, some of the guest state, well, some of the state in general, gets pushed on the hypervisor stack at runtime. Uh, and that's the fact that, because we you know, write things in a high-level language. Um, well, in limited cases, the hypervisor itself could map some guest memory. But that's pretty rare, certainly on the ARM64 side, that doesn't happen. So an interesting example is the, the ARM TRNG hypercall, um, which basically offers a service to the guest to uh, get entropy and presumably high quality entropy. Uh, but one, one thing that can happen is that that entropy gets written onto the hypervisor stack um, because you know, register spills, anything like that could happen. Uh, that could be retrieved via read gadget and you know, reasonable timing attack. Um, and this is worrying. Uh, worries people, I get emails, oh, how can we do? Um, so, but it's all fine because the, the architecture has a solution for us. And uh, that's a literal quote from the this ARM spec that says that uh, you, you need to discard all the entropy bits uh, once you've communicated them to the guest uh, or to the requesting EL, and you overwrite them with zeros. Hey, OK, that's interesting. but. Uh, Allow me to be a bit hyperbolic here. Um, the hypervisor uh, keeps a record of the vCPU state. Uh, and that includes copies of the registers. So discarding the, that entropy is, is really counterproductive. Are we going just to zero the, the guest registers? Because, oh no, we can't, com we can't possibly keep that entropy around. That's also the fact that, as I said before, the hypervisor is written in a, <coughs> in a high level language. Yes, people, C is a high-level language. <laughs> but um, it does, it, C doesn't track uh, what gets spilled on the stack. And more importantly, uh, the stack is not visible, so we can't even control what's there. It all depends on the compiler. Um, and then there's some uh, ARM-specific considerations. Uh, is that without cache maintenance operations, I, well, you can actually retrieve the data. Uh, you need a, a simply an uncache mapping. Um, 
So if you perform cash maintenance operations, um, to what level? We, we have multiple of levels in the ARM architectures. Uh, we're not going to go into these details. But yeah, you can flush to any of these levels. And if you spy data at the level below, you could retrieve um, the data as there. Um, so that doesn't work as a security feature. We could map everything as non-cacheable. It's not an actual suggestion. Um, so we need something else. And ideally, we need a way to isolate the memory that is used by the hypervisor uh, was dealing with a VCP. Uh, and if you haven't had uh, enough of MMU talks yesterday, uh, well, yes, this is about page tables. So uh, let's get back a bit. And uh, you've probably seen these slides uh, tons of times, uh, the way uh, the exception levels work on, on ARM64. Uh, so we have the uh, ARMv8.0 exception model, which has in non -secure, on the non-secure side, three, three exception levels. We have uh, ER0 for user space, ER1 uh, for the kernel, which has two uh, page table uh, base register. We call them translation table base register. Basically, you get two routes, one for the kernel, one for user space. And we have ER2, our hypervisor level, which has a single one, uh, so single address space. And, um, how does KVM use that mode? And we call it NVHE for obscure reasons that uh, you'll see in a couple of slides. Uh, is that um, on the on the left left side of, of this slide we have uh, the basically the, the host. It's not a VM, but really the, the host user space and kernel, um, which uh, use their own um, isolation primitive their own page tables. We have the KVM world switch which runs at ER2. And the guest um, runs in the middle of, the, of this diagram um, with uh, being wrapped by what we call stage two page tables, so uh, the equivalent of um, EPT on XH6. That provides the isolation we need. So an interesting uh, thing to notice is that uh, from, a, from a translation perspective, um, ER2, has, having only one TTBR, has all its address space skewed to zero. So any data that, that, that needs to be shared between the Linux kernel and um, ER2, the hypervisor, uh, needs to be mapped at an offset. So anything that is mapped in that TTBR1 region in blue gets, can get mapped to the, uh, into the ER2 uh, address space at, at, at an offset from zero, which means that if we follow pointers at ER2, we need to offset them at runtime. We have ways to do that relatively efficiently by live patching the code at good time. But it's still uh, not a significant overhead, but it's there. You have to think about it. So how does PKVM uh, use that same mode? Well, it's, it's basically the same, except that uh, we now have a stage two that wraps the host as well. Uh, and that provides the isolation guarantee that we need so that when we give the guest some memory, we remove it from the host stage two, and lo and behold, it can't access it. Um, that's quite neat. Uh, not necessarily massively efficient, but it, it's quite neat. Um, what does it mean in terms of uh, translation? Um, well, it's actually exactly the same, except that we can play with permissions so that a page given to ER2 from uh, the, ho the the host kernel, we can either uh, totally give exclusive access to ER2, uh, or we can keep some access at ER1 if we want to share data between the host ER1 and ER2. So that gives us a final grade. In the previous mode, we could you know, write everywhere from ER1. There's no security uh, boundary between the two. So that's um, 8.0, also known as old stuff. Um, but fear not, since uh, 8.1, uh, eight years ago, uh, we've improved that. And we have this uh, 8.1 plus exception model, uh, which is a bit different in the sense that um, ER1 has disappeared um, temporarily. Um, but ER2 has gained an extra TTBR. So it can, has, is back to, it's back to having two, um, two set of page tables. And how KVM uses this, um, 
like this. So it's, it's a lot simpler in a way because um, Linux and KVM basically share the same address space. Actually, KVM doesn't exist on its own. It's part of the kernel. And it's very similar uh, conceptually, in a way, to what other architectures do. Um, so um, of course, in that mode, we can't have really something that like uh, the standard PKVM. We can't wrap ER2 with its own stage 2. That doesn't really make sense. That, that's not how things can be built. So we need to play a bit of a game. And it's the letter soup game. So we have um, NVHE, we have VHE. Uh, how about we invent uh, HVHE? None of that is architectural. I made this up. Um, but the idea is, why do we force PKVM to use the NVHE model on hardware that actually supports VHE? What we, one thing we could do is actually enable VHE for ER2 only, um, and still run the kernel um, at ER1. And it's basically the, um, the NVHE logical model, but using the VHE infrastructure. We just have to pretend that uh, we're running a guest when we're actually running the host. And conceptually, that's exactly what PKVM does already. We just need to set a, a bit in a, in a system register, this TGE bit, which means Trap general exception, we set that to zero. That really tells the architecture, now I'm running a guest. I'm not going to bother taking exception, which should be rooted from, for example, from ELC or to EL1. Don't want to see them at EL2. So how does that translate into you know, address spaces, or rather memory layout for now? Um, well, we get these two VA ranges. Uh, so we go from this mode at the top, the NVHE model, to the one at the bottom where we can actually uh, move the hypervisor mappings to TTBR1, which means we don't need to play this translation game uh, at runtime. We can just use pointers at face value. We'll probably have to sanitize them. Uh, but at runtime, we, we don't need to, to offset them. That's quite neat. Uh, saves us you know, a, few, a few instructions. Um, but also a few headaches. Um, interestingly, um, TTBR0 is actually unused um, for now. We'll see that later. So what does it mean for PKVM with this new fancy HVHE mode? Well, it looks a lot like the previous incarnation of PKVM, except that we have now this blue box on the side, um, which serves absolutely no purpose. Uh, so what is it? Good for absolutely nothing. Um, we still use a single uh, address space for ER2, but uh, we have some fun moving things around. Uh, it's always a nice thing to have. Um, and now we can run on uh, on the Apple CPUs, which have uh, which can only run VHE, silver lining. So, what does it take us? Um, well, before we we can move uh, forward. We need to have a look at um, a couple of extra things. And we'll see how all that come together. So uh, the ARM architecture has this concept of ACID, address space identifier. <coughs> and that is actually used to tag TLBs. So you can make TLBs actually non-global with this bit called NG, on global. Um, <coughs> and it's conceptually similar to PCID on x86. Basically allows you to have address space, and Linux uses that to isolate user space context. So each address space gets its own set of page tables, its own ACID, and you know that any translation that will be cached in the TLBs will have that tag, uh, and so you can't, from one, uh, from one uh, address space, hit uh, someone else's translations. And that can be used as long as you have two TTBRs, uh, and that's described in the architecture as the uh, EL1 and 0, and EL2 and 0 transition regimes. And that's exactly what we've uh, showed earlier. So another concept, uh, which has nothing to do with this, is the concept of loading a vCPU uh, on KVM. And that has the effect of making a vCPU notionally resident. And so you vCPU load, and yeah, 
KVM knows that, okay, we're dealing at the moment with this vCPU. You reverse that with vCPU put, that no vCPU is resident on this physical CPU. And that's exactly what we use it for on ARM64. So any state that is compatible with the current execution uh, of the host <coughs> can be directly loaded on the physical CPU. Anything that needs to be, that would disrupt the execution of the host uh, is loaded immediately before we actually jump into the vCPU itself. So far, so good. With PKVM, we add a few additional uh, restrictions. Is that uh, if you've loaded uh, a vCPU on a physical CPU, you can't run another one. You need to do a put before. So you can't play games. You're not allowed to play games with that. Another game you can't play is load a vCPU on a physical CPU and try to load it again on another physical CPU. Uh, PKVM has code that ensures that this is not possible. And we're going to, uh, to make use of this. Uh, and apologies to Virginia Woolf, or their fan. Um, so what if we could make it so that, as I said, a vCPU could ma be made only resident on the physical CPU at a time? We already had that guarantee um, with PKVM. But also had its own address space in the hypervisor. And had its state only mapped in the address space. If we could add to that a stack dedicated to uh, the execution at TR2 and only mapped in this array space, if we could do that, well, well, we can actually. We have an extra address space. Um, and we have an extra VA range actually. And because we are in the EL2 and 0 transition regime, we can make use of that extra blue box that we had earlier and, um, and map there the vCPU state and uh, the a hypervisor stack used in the context of dealing with that vCPU. And if it feels like a bit like some kind of twisted user space, yeah, it's about that. But we'll, we'll uh, talk about that later. It's really a strong isolation primitive. It gives you uh, per vCPU TLBs. And um, there's a property in the ARM architecture that guarantees that, the, unless you, you say otherwise, that uh, TLBs are CPU private. You can't share those between CPUs, even on an SMT system, which are thankfully pretty rare for us. Um, so you get that, that notion of, of really per vCPU, per physical CPU isolation. And that comes with um, another interesting uh, bonus, is that you get um, fixed maps um, for most of these things. So since uh, each vCPU has its own address space, the vCPU can live at a, at a fixed address in that address space, which means you do not need to follow a pointer to reach that vCPU. You know, if you map it at 64K, it will always be at 64K. And you can make sure that all your vCPUs that map at this address, um, all the pointer chasing becomes just loading a constant. Right? It's a mild improvement, but it's one. Um, and the same thing for the vCPU stack. You know exactly where it is. You don't need to store the, the, the address in a data structure. If you want, you can randomize those at one time. Um, and still, you know, it will still be relatively, so it will still be constant. Um, so we end up with a bunch of per vCPU, per CPU fixed maps. And a consequence of that is that any register spill on the stack is now only visible to this vCPU, to this physical CPU, sorry. Um, because we can only map this vCPU once on this uh, physical CPU. But it's a guarantee that it does. Yes? When you said per CPU, does that mean uh, that you only see it on one CPU at a time? Or that so the question is, uh, is, does it mean that the, you can only see it on one CPU at a time or map at a different address on, the s on another physical CPU? Is that the question? Yes. Uh, no, it's only mapped once on the single CPU and nowhere else. And it's the same address in all CPUs? It's the same address on all CPUs, but for different contexts. Yeah. So everybody has the same address, 
uh, and since you can only map, you only have one register to map something, you can't map two things at the same address. They have mutually exclusive. Um, so if we go back to this uh, diagram, we see that uh, yeah, in that blue box, we now have these uh, vCPU state and their stack. And that's our isolation context now for the execution of, a, of, this, current, of this vCPU in the context of ER2. Um, in terms of code, what does it look like? Uh, well, that's not the, the real thing, where I've condensed it a bit and uh, removed a few things. Um, it's basically about um, fetching um, the, a vCPU uh, structure, finding the TTBR0 that contains the, um, the, the root of the page tables, um, performing some synchronization, switching, ta uh, switching stack, sorry, and, um, and we're gone. Um, so this, this right uh, sysreg R2 really sets both the ACID and the root of the page tables atomically. That's, that's an important construct. I'm going to have to go fast now. Uh, so the, um, f of course, this comes as a cost. Uh, it's extra memory allocation. We need four page tables. Um, we need uh, an extra page for the stack at TL2 per vCPU. And uh, we need a zero page uh, where no vCPU is resident, but we, can't, we can point all the, all the TTBRs to, to, to that one just to make sure we don't fetch any, any extra TLDs uh, when no vCPU is resident. We need an ACID allocator, which limits the number of vCPU. On most, uh, on most hardware, it's 2 to the 16th. Yeah, that should be enough. Plus a reserved one when no vCPU is resident. Um, what's bad? Well, we've killed PKVM on 8.0. Oh, well. Uh, I don't think anyone will shed a tear, but OK, it's, it's still an important consideration. Uh, we, maybe we can do more in two minutes and 30 seconds. Um, we can do sandboxes. And why would we like to sandbox things? Is that uh, PKVM on mobile devices uh, really doesn't only want to isolate uh, VMs and, uh, and hosts from each other on the CPU. We also need to do the same thing for DMA. And we need IOMMUs to perform the isolation, uh, as it turns out, on mobile SOCs. Uh, they're not necessarily standard IOMMUs. They come with all sorts of really weird and wonderful uh, power management requirements, which means we need to have some kind of small drivers in the hypervisor. So how do we make that stick uh, in terms of enabling PKVM on a large set of systems and still maintain some level of sanity? Uh, as a, you know, a maintainer, I, you know, I tend to fear these kind of things. Um, so how about we do hypervisor modules? Well, you know, it's not exactly new. Uh, we've had that in the past. Uh, I mean, not necessarily uh, for the hypervisor, but you know, we have kernel modules. Um, but kernel modules are not necessarily totally ideal for what we're trying to do. Uh, well, first, we don't have really an EL2 API. And at the same time, we're also trying to you know, reduce the amount of privileged code. So what if we could uh, sandbox those? Um, well, we have address spaces now, uh, but only to map data. Well, we could also use that as a primitive to actually run code. We just need to make mappings executable there. Um, we just need to treat it as, oh, well, user space again, um, which means setting TG to 1 because in that case, we want to trap exception from there. We read to ER0, our user space, and start executing our module. Easy peasy. Uh, System call to go back to ER2, reset TG. By design, this module doesn't have access to uh, any vCPU state because they compete for the same TTBR. So that's, again, a good isolation primitive. So that's what it is uh, in the end. Um, we have just you know, extra uh, hypervisor code running at TL0, uh, deprivileged. So as a conclusion, uh, which is not quite a conclusion really, um, so we have basic blocks to you know, provide data and code isolation for the privileged part of, of PKVM. We can introduce some form of uh, driver modularity uh, to deal with a really complex ecosystem. But that was the easy part. Uh, the, the hard part is to define how we make use of this sandboxing in terms of API, in terms of you know, loading this module, guaranteeing that they do the right thing.
uh, defining an API. That's, that's the next challenge. And yes, it's a, it's a huge work in progress. And I'm out of time. So thank you. We have 10 seconds for questions. <laughs> well, otherwise, I'm around uh, all day, so feel free to, to, to drag me. Okay. Uh, so is there a cost in changing the TTBR in terms of PLD? Uh, no, that's the, that's the whole point. Changing TTBR doesn't change your, your, it doesn't have any influence of TLB. It just changed the way you will um, populate the next lot of TLB, but TTBR. Architecture doesn't invalidate anything. So the only pressure you put on the TLB yeah. is adding some entry for your TLB. Yeah, but you you had this that that pressure already by virtue of having of already having a mapping. So you've 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 moved um, an ER two mapping to an ER zero mapping, but still have the thing. Well. Hold on. <laughs> Repeat that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but any red application that would be on the host. Yeah. Well, we could do that, but we'd need a context to erect to that. Uh, why not? But that that seems. The, the problem is that you you erect into something we have you have hardly any control on. Um, okay, Maybe we can look into this, but I, I find that <laughs> slightly jarring. But uh, I mean, yeah, we <laughs> happy to happy to to entertain the idea. Christopher. Yeah, probably. But then for your module, would you be jumping into that in ER0, or would that still just be a question of isolation as well? Uh, you would be jumping to ER0, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't have access to the, to, to the, the privileged uh, part of the, uh, of, of the hypervisor. Right, but that wasn't the case for your VCPU case table. So that's just about access. So that's, that's just about data, and it's only uh, being accessed from ER2. Right. Thank you. Anyone else? We are out of time anyway. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>